So today we're going to talk about hybrid orbitals. And we talk about hybrid orbitals because we want to be able to explain, explain geometries that we derive from Vesper theory and from Lewis dot diagrams. What's important to know is that hybrid orbitals form when atomic orbitals actually mix. And the shape of a hybrid orbital is different than the original atomic orbital shape. So for instance, if we're going to look at beryllium difluoride, beryllium difluoride we know from our Lewis dot diagram, then from the Vesper, dot, Vesper theory diagram, that it is a linear structure, and you can see that it has a 180 degree bond angle. The way we actually show in terms of orbital overlap, which is the bonding situation that we're looking at, is that the fluorines maintain and keep their 2p orbitals. Beryllium, however, has to hybridize and form two different orbitals in order, in order for the bonding situation to occur. So these are called sp hybrid orbitals. The two p's are maintained in the fluorine, and we'll show in the next couple of boards how this actually occurs. So if we're talking about sp hybrid orbitals, so we're considering beryllium difluoride, Vesper tells us that it is linear with two identical beryllium fluorine bonds. However, if you look at beryllium in its gram state, which I actually drew here in uh, electron box diagrams, in its gram state, we know that beryllium is 1s2, 2s2, which shows that all four of these electrons are paired. Because they're paired, bonds cannot occur if we leave them in the ground state. The only way that bonds can actually occur is if you have unpairing, because it is the unpaired electrons that have to pair with one another in order for a bond to occur. So in order for us to be able to explain how beryllium difluoride actually forms, we have to unpair these two last valence electrons. The way we do that is we have to hybridize the central atom. And every time we hybridize, we only hybridize the central atom. The, bond, the atoms that bond to the central atom, they don't get hybridized. So the way we do that is we're going to combine the 1s and 1p together. And they form an sp orbital. These two sp orbitals now have each one of these electrons are unpaired, and now they can be easily paired with each one of the fluorines. The way this actually looks when you combine them, as we saw on the first board, is that the 2s plus one of the 2p orbitals actually morph together and form two equivalent balloon structures. Right, so the two little balloon structures actually look like this, and these are two equivalent sp orbitals. These two actually overlap, so these little pieces, the two little nodes, overlap with one another, and that signifies the actual beryllium nucleus, which I drew in there. So important thing to note, is that the two morph form two identical hybrid orbitals, which then are able to overlap with one another. In each one of these, you have one of the unpaired electrons, which can then pair with the 2p orbitals of the F, and you get the bonding situation that we saw on the first board. Important thing to note is that sp orbitals give the linear shape. Okay. SP2 hybrid orbitals, we're going to talk about formaldehyde, and formaldehyde, the formaldehyde Vesper structure tells us that it is trigonal planar. You have one carbon double bonded with oxygen, and two equivalent carbon-hydrogen bonds. So if we were to draw the box diagrams, of oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, we wouldn't be able to account for that shape 
if we leave the carbon in the form that it is right now. If we left it in this form, the only two electrons that are unpaired are in the 2p orbitals, which would either double bond with only the oxygen leaving the two hydrogens unpaired, or these two could bond with each other, which would mean that it wouldn't be bonded with oxygen. But it is, so we have to be able to explain how that actually occurs. And the way we can do that is if we hybridize. So this time we're taking the S and we're going to combine it with two p orbitals. And what we actually get are three equivalent sp2 orbitals. We leave one of the p's unhybridized with one electron that is unpaired. That is the nature of a double bonding situation where you have a sigma bond and a pi bond. We'll get to that in another lecture. But for the moment, what I wanted to point out is that you can actually now achieve the two equivalent carbon-hydrogen bonds because you're actually pairing uh, these electrons together and now you see that you have one of the sp2 hybrid orbitals pairs with one of the two p's from oxygen and the two p that was left unhybridized now pairs with another two p of the oxygen which gives you that double bond. This gives the one sigma bond, this gives the the 2p pi overlap, which gives you that pi bond that you end up getting in formaldehyde. Okay, so we're going to break for a second. We're moving on to the next two boards. Okay, so moving on with sp3 hybrid orbitals, let's consider methane, CH4. The VESPER model tells us uh, that we are to expect a tetrahedral shape with four equivalent carbon-hydrogen bonds that are singly bonded we have to be able to account for that. So let's start off, let's draw our box diagrams for carbon and for each of the hydrogens, 1s1, each of them has one unpaired electron, our carbon 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Again, we wouldn't be able to show overlap the way we need to to justify a tetrahedral shape. So what do we have to do? Just like we do with every other model, we have to hybridize the central atom in order to account for the four equivalent bonding pairs. How do we do that? Well, we're going to combine the two S, so S and three of the P orbitals to give us four equivalent SP3s, which I drew here. These are four equivalent SP3s the 2s2 now unpairs, so you have four unpaired electrons, which can now very easily pair with each one of the hydrogens to give us four equivalent bonding situations. And again, remember that you're only hybridizing the central atom. How does this actually look? Now we are combining the s orbital, which is this guy, and each of the three p orbitals. So we're combining the px, py, and pz. All four of these orbitals morph together and combine and make a completely different structure, which is four equivalent sp3 orbitals. And again, they take on these balloon-like structures when you combine them. And when they actually combine, they form this tetrahedral shape which you have a node in the middle, and the node is the carbon nucleus. Now, each one of these orbitals has one unpaired electron. And now the hydrogens can come in and pair. drew it as a sphere because we know that hydrogen has only s orbitals. So now this is the way you represent the bonding situation. Okay, same thing with the other two. Let's consider phosphorus pentachloride. Um, Vesper theory tells us that we're going to have five equivalent phosphorus chlorine bonds. How do we account for that? Well, we have to draw out the box diagram of phosphorus. And then we know that we have to pair it. We have to have five different bonds. 
The only way we can account for that is if we combine the S, three P's, and now one of the D's. When you combine them together, I'm going to erase these for now. When you combine them together, you make five equivalent SP3D hybrid orbitals. Now you can imagine that each one of these electrons can be paired with each one of the unpaired electrons from each of the, four, each of the five chlorine atoms. What's important to note, sp3d always makes the trigonal bipyramidal structure in Vesper. Very similarly, let's talk about sulfur hexafluoride. Sulfur hexafluoride gives us an octahedral structure. We have to account for that again. So now we have to combine the three S, three of the P's, and now two D's to make a hybrid of six equivalent unpaired electrons, six equivalent hybrid orbitals. SP3D2, now each of these six fluoride unpaired electrons can pair, and you get your octahedral shape. SP3D2, octahedral six equivalent orbitals.